good afternoon, everyone. I, I say let's start. Um, my name is Daniela Negoita, and uh, I'm a junior researcher at the European Value Study, and uh, today I will chair this session. Um, as you can gather from, uh, from the title of this session, uh, the speakers will, uh, will provide with um, further insight into how to manage and share uh, the data and the tools uh, developed across the different um, shock work packages, uh, namely work package free, uh, aimed at developing uh, research infrastructure services uh, that should benefit the broader social sciences and humanities, then work package four, uh, focused on innovations in uh, data production, and uh, finally, or package five, um, that facilitated innovations in data access. Uh, in line of the open science paradigm, uh, these tools uh, and services were uh, developed to, to support uh, an efficient and uh, innovative data access and work workflow, of course. Uh, the purpose of such act actions is to uh, ensure scientific quality and um, foster knowledge and discovery. So the different teams um, made uh, important efforts to, to render accessible and uh, reusable different types of data, uh, such as survey data, as, uh, as exemplified by, uh, by the European Social uh, survey um, cloud infrastructure and, uh, and the survey codings project, um, survey textual data um, as shown by, uh, by the tremendous work uh, carried out within uh, the multilingual corpus of survey questionnaires and uh, finally health data uh, linked to survey data accomplished within uh, the six and eight waves of uh, the SHARE program. Uh, a cornerstone of uh, the shock project I would like to focus on uh, is the compliance with the fair principles. And as you will see throughout the session, uh, the different uh, tasks were uh, implemented, bearing in mind the, the uptake of uh, the machine readable framework. Uh, so the, the teams uh, channeled energies to make these resources. Uh, findable, accessible, interoperable, and uh, reusable, not only by the humans, but also by computational systems. Uh, of course, along the way, a number of uh, bottlenecks in, uh, in the attainment of uh, the fair objectives had to be overcome, um, so such as uh, the ethical issues around uh, the, um, the, the biomedical data, um, of course, the cleaning, uh, standardization and uh, harmonization of different types and formats of survey data. Uh, obviously, uh, within the, um, the survey codings project, uh, the, um, the validity of multilingual classifications, and, uh, and finally, um, the, the dissemination and storage of, uh, of the European social survey uh, data. Uh, however, the task teams were uh, persistent uh, to succeed and uh, today we are here to present and promote uh, the, the successful milestones achieved over the past 40 months. Um, okay, so without further ado, I would like to introduce the first two speakers um, who are part of uh, the task 5.5, uh, Budil and uh, Archana Bidargadi. Uh, Budil is a product manager at the Norwegian Center for uh, Research Data, and Archana is the technical project lead, uh, always at the Norwegian Center for, uh, for the Research uh, Data. Uh, Budil, the floor is yours. Thank you. I think we were talking a little bit past each other because uh, our organization has actually disappeared. We have become a new agency for service provision uh, for education and research. So uh, there is no more any NSD, but the services uh, um, are still there. We are still the data archive for the European Social Survey. And uh, it is uh, Ashana who is our uh, lead, uh, our tech lead 
for data management who will present what we have done um, in task 5.5, ESS as, as a service, a pilot making cross-national survey data fair, uh, which, will, which pilots how cross-national longitudinal survey data and metadata can be prepared and provide services for the EOSC. But I first, um, yeah, so we are, an, um, we are a dual team and um, you are actually in India today, um, Ashana, from Vadodara in southern western India. And uh, I would first just like to, I suppose most of you have heard about the European Social Survey. But just to make sure that, uh, that people know what it is, it is a big cross-national survey, research data, from, um, three, uh, no, from 30 plus countries gathered over about uh, 20 years. Um, and um, we are also an infrastructure working with national teams in all these countries, um, carrying out in-person interviews now but the times are changing and uh, so we have started uh, uh, working on multimodal uh, uh, data gathering um, and the, the people who are being interviewed are representative uh, samples of each of the countries we carry out the survey every two years it has taken a long time uh, this last time but there will be new data out in June so, Ashana, please, the floor is yours. Thank you, Budya. So, uh, we worked for the last couple of years on the task 5.5 and uh, to make ESS uh, data repository, ESS as a service. So, the whole idea of uh, this task was to make ESS data uh, mm, more fair compliant and also accessible both for humans and uh, uh, machine actionable. And uh, agenda today, what I would like to talk is first of all ESS as a service, what it is. Uh, Budil has given us a brief introduction to it and I'll introduce a little bit of ESS workflow and the service architecture briefly, and then we hop on to recommendations from what we learned and the, our whole journey and what we could, the learnings we could share with you all today. ESS uh, as service, uh, it's since uh, 2009, uh, 2001, and as Budil mentioned, uh, is a survey that is conducted across 30 plus countries, and it's uh, 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 every two years, and uh, currently the uh, 10th round is going on and the activities to make the curation and make the data available is going on and it's the first time that the new round all of the work will be happening in the new platform and the data will be made accessible only in the new platform so until 9 we had all the data accessible in the older platform and we did a major migration to the new platform last year and uh, the whole uh, purpose of ESS as a service is to achieve as much as uh, fairness, both make it findable, accessible, and the corner store or the innovation part of it was to make it interoperable uh, and reusable. Here the ESS workflow uh, is uh, uh, e part of, uh, this is not part of the project, uh, it is external to the project, but we still consider it holistically. And we have an external service that is uh, my ESS, and that is the data de uh, deposit portal. And we integrated up with it, wherein the my ESS kind of uh, uh, countries uh, are able to send in their data through using my ESS and deposit the data in the Azure Blob Storage. And uh, our team at uh, uh, SICT who uh, curate the data can have access to the data, do the processing, and also the data syncs back to my ISS so that the countries have uh, insight to what is happening. 
Uh, also, we try to achieve full transparency in the whole processing, data processing uh, uh, routines. So all the processing uh, scripts and changes to the data that have been done and all communication are transparent. At the same time, making sure that uh, cross uh, national, uh, their privacy is kind of contained. So the access is to your own country's data and all changes happening to your own data and not otherwise. So that is also maintained. So we have an upload, we have processing. Upload is where uh, countries send their data. Processing is uh, the area where uh, we do the data processing. Draft and draft is uh, for review and check and feedback. And final is when we have uh, completed the data processing for a particular country. And then we run a file integration and harmonization process, which is then published uh, to a, a dissemination, uh, uh, a dissemination uh, data storage. And the previous data storages are not performance tuned for dissemination purpose, but more for long-term preservation and stuff. But the published data storage is uh, uh, configured for dissemination performance. And also we have other services that kind of build um, both, uh, sorry, data and metadata together and make it available for the website. Here, the, if you see the data is, it has one workflow and then we have metadata which is disjoint from the data that is, uh, we, we use Collectica metadata uh, repository, uh, which is based on the data life cycle uh, to, uh, process metadata that's coming in. However, we build the connection between the data and metadata in the metadata elements. That way we can drive systems uh, for data access and data uh, download. Uh, a brief, a brief uh, architecture, this is a very uh, high level architecture. I didn't want to go into details because the focus is recommendation. Uh, so here what we have done is uh, we have used a third party uh, so solutions, Collectica solutions. We use Collectica repository for data, metadata storage. We use uh, Collectica metadata curation application that's called Collectica designer. And we use Collectica workflow to copy over uh, from um, uh, one repository to the other repository. We have a processing repository where the curation is happening. And once we are happy with the curation, we publish the data to the published repository, which is actually the source of truth for all our metadata. And that publishing happens through the workflow. And these three are uh, third party components and we have used them as part of our complete infrastructure. And uh, at the same time, we have uh, blob storages in Azure where we store data flat files uh, and not in any uh, databases. So the flat files help us easy access uh, to uh, st structuring the data storage, managing the versioning, and also to uh, process the files easily. And uh, access to these blob storage and processing of data happens through Azure Machine Learning even though it's machine le um, Azure Machine Learning is a huge uh, service, uh, service uh, Azure service, but we don't use most of it. What we use is the capa uh, capability of Azure Machine Learning uh, service to host Jupyter Notebooks, wherein we can process the data using uh, Python uh, scripts and Jupyter Notebooks. And uh, it also provides a collaborative workspace. It provides a possibility to connect to data storage in Azure and also uh, access metadata through GraphQL. So it was uh, also, we evaluated as we were working, we evaluated the easiest and the most effective solutions that would help us. We could have built uh, all that uh, Collectica uh, solutions provide, but it would be time consuming and also costly and complex, and hence we chose uh, to use the third party. Similarly, using Azure ML gave us a lot of uh, quick solutions and also ability to solve our problems at, as soon and as easily. And this also uh, has helped us to uh, build the competence of the curation data processing team 
uh, we have gone from SAS and SPSS processing to Python and Pandas and the Jupyter Notebook processing. So the level of uh, data processing competence and skills has increased. And all our communication between uh, services happen through GraphQL. And we have built a dissemination service wherein we have metadata transformer, uh, which kind of custom builds uh, metadata for our purpose. Collectica repositories have their own REST API. Uh, and my, uh, one can access the REST API directly and make calls to it. But we have chosen to use GraphQL as our uh, primary uh, API. Uh, and here we wanted uh, to transform the metadata that would serve our uh, services easily, as uh, build custom structures of the metadata and uh, provide what we wanted in our services for search, uh, landing pages, download, and also analysis. And we have a service stack engine, which is the kind of the brain of all analysis and download, which builds, uh, which reads metadata from the repository and uh, has access to the data files in the Azure Blob storages and can uh, build, uh, can make analysis, can build custom files, and also prepare files for download. And all this connection between the client and the, the service stack engine goes through GraphQL. And we have built a single uh, sign-on for uh, users to log in using multiple uh, 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 accounts, Google and uh, Edugain and also ESS accounts. This is the basic uh, service architecture. And uh, the recommendations, uh, this is the focus of this presentation. So uh, our recommendations from our learnings of the development, it's just not the solution as a end product, but the whole journey we have taken through in this uh, project is uh, both organizational, uh, technical, and domain specific recommendations. And uh, briefly said, uh, our recommendations are around six. First is agile approach and cross-functional team. The success of uh, this uh, task force is basically because we had an agile, lean, and design thinking processes. And uh, we have a very strong cross-functional team that is uh, built, uh, that is the center for all the success we have. Then uh, the API first approach, the, I go into details a little later on. So uh, then we have adopt best applicable protocols, enabling metadata driven services, connecting data and metadata, and build uh, data solutions for download and analysis. These are our few recommendations. Going into detail of this uh, agile approach and cross-functional teams, uh, success, as I said, was autonomous cross-functional team with experts both in technical competence, cloud competence, uh, in uh, statistical uh, uh, software development competence, metadata experts who were very, very good in DDI lifecycle uh, metadata standard, and data competence to know how the data is structured and how it is used and what it means. And uh, we adopted design thinking, sense and respond, lean and agile in praxis. When we, when we precise uh, underline praxis, meaning that it is not a methodology on paper or structured in the way uh, theoretically, but more uh, in praxis wherein we had a sense of uh, ownership, a team ownership to what we were doing. We had daily stand-up meetings wherein everyone took part and both uh, domain and uh, technical and uh, strategy or prioritizing uh, were discussed in the meetings. So everybody were informed and involved in all decision making. And if in case there were need for extensive workshops to learn or find out or test, uh, we had those in other than the daily uh, stand-up meetings. And also we had sufficient mandate and resources because it was completely autonomous. Though we had reporting to the uh, no, project uh, uh, board, internal project board, uh, the team was completely self-sufficient, could take their own decisions, and they had the safe 
safe space to fail, to try, to test different solutions. Uh, the success we have is because we have gone to multiple iterations of trying solutions and going, going, we implemented a solution, we thought it was right. After a couple of months, we found that we, there was a better way of doing it and we went back to drawing boards and the brainstorm tried out, tested and then did the whole redo of solutions. And this was also possible because it is not a monolith uh, platform, but uh, microservices based platforms. So it was easy to uh, uh, f uh, change parts of it without having to change the whole solution. And uh, also we conducted multiple workshops and presentations to cross pollinate technical and domain knowledge. Uh, through these two, three years, we have worked on this project. We can say that the domain experts, metadata and uh, data experts have more competence in API and doing queries, also understanding the cloud technology and vice versa. The technical team has more understanding of metadata standard and data and also analysis and everything. So we function as a very good team. And API first. Uh, this is an approach we have, uh, not just in the project, but as a whole organization, the pri previous uh, uh, Norwegian Center for Research Data, we had these, is it as a part of our technical strategy to have API first. So what does API first means that we are not uh, focusing on the clients and we're not focusing the backend. What we are fo focusing is how to build the API queries that would service no matter which uh, client. So. It, was, it is trying to solve the user needs at the core. And this des designing API was a teamwork and the discussions in daily meetings led to designing the APIs, fine tuning the APIs, and also always making sure that the APIs uh, not only serve the clients, but are also in line with the standards we are using, the DDI lifecycle standards and the processes the domain people are involved in. So it became uh, actually a common language for of, of communication within the core team. And now we can proudly say that most of the team members uh, can run uh, GraphQL queries and uh, are well versed with it. And protocol adoption. I think this is a core for any success we have had, uh, making the ESS as a service uh, interoperable because as long as we have good protocols adopted, then we are in line with industry standards and we are not making up things. So the uh, matching what we built to other systems is of higher uh, uh, probability. And what uh, the, uh, some of the protocols which we adopted is first and foremost DDI lifecycle. ESS was already adopting DDI lifecycle for curation purpose, but it was not adopting DDI lifecycle for dissemination purpose. They still use DDI codebook earlier. Uh, however, in this project, we have moved on to DDI lifecycle for the complete process. From ingest to dissemination download, we have used DDI lifecycle, and we have taken to use more DDI elements. And uh, in collaboration with the Collectica team, we have expanded support for uh, multiple uh, uh, elements in the collective repository and the services. For example, controlled vocabularies and uh, versioning and stuff like that. And uh, this has actually increased the machine actionability and interoperability of the data. And GraphQL API, as I mentioned earlier, this is one of the protocols. And this GraphQL API is designed to support strong types offers flexibility of various clients consuming GraphQL API. Uh, the REST API wherein you have to have, uh, you get all the response, uh, even if you need just one or two of the elements, uh, versus th that kind of uh, GraphQL supports wherein you, can, you get what you want. This means we can build very lean and thin and responsive clients, and also mobile clients, which are very flexible. So this also encourages uh, external API and internal uh, implementation uh, kind of decoupling it. It doesn't matter how your internal implementation is as long as uh, and, uh, your API is stable. So this is a very, uh, we have been very happy with adoption of GraphQL API. 
And uh, for login purposes, what we have used is uh, open ID, uh, uh, open ID, uh, and also OAuth. Uh, OAuth uh, 2.0 is industry standard protocol for authorization, and uh, uh, Open ID Connector is an API-friendly uh, implementation of the OAuth 2.0. And uh, OIDC has also, since it's API-friendly, we have been able to reuse our single sign-on solutions we already had uh, at NSD and uh, implement, uh, make ESS users experience a smooth access to data and metadata. The other protocols which we used was Terraform. Terraform is a, a text-based uh, infrastructure describing language or a tool. Uh, and through this, we described all the uh, uh, cloud resources which we wanted to use in the uh, service. Uh, why, how is this use of Terraform different from uh, just configuring, configuring using UI is that it becomes very manageable, versionable, and also very consistent and efficiency. So uh, it supports infrastructure as a code, and this is something we have our uh, cloud uh, strategies uh, adopted. So this kind of enabled more people also to learn about defining and managing the cloud resources we have defined in the project. Then going uh, forward, we have adopted Apache Parquet uh, as a data file format for dissemination. For uh, regular storage, we have used uh, SPSS file format. For preservation purpose, we have used the open format text uh, and CS CSV format. Uh, but for dissemination, we have used Parquet format. And Parquet format is an open source columnar data storage file format. And it is designed columnar, unlike the others which are row based. This also makes uh, uh, analyzing these files and uh, uh, subsetting the files much quicker and faster. So through uh, our notebooks and Python and Pandas uh, services, we could uh, build uh, fast performing quick uh, download solutions. Uh, last is the JSON uh, protocol, which we have used for uh, metadata uh, uh, communication. Uh, JSON is uh, an open text-based uh, based, uh, data interchange format. And uh, Collectica supports JSON uh, format. Uh, and this has been very easy for us to adopt in our API. So all our consumption of metadata happens as, far as a JSON format. And this is easy to read for humans and also machines can parse and generate it. So this is much, uh, there's a lot of debate going on between JSON and XML. I won't go into it, but for us, JSON works and we are moving, not just in this project, but in many projects, we are going, moving towards JSON than XML. Uh, uh, I don't see anybody, so if I'm running out of time, somebody has to give me a voice ping. Yes, please. Arkana, please, uh, you should wrap up now. Yeah, so I'll just take a minute. So enabling metadata-driven services, as I mentioned, versioning of data and documents is important, versioning of metadata, control vocabularies, and universal unique identifier. DDI lifecycle supports all of these, and we have extended Collectica solutions to, uh, which didn't support some of it, like controlled vocabularies, and we have uh, adopted SESTA uh, controlled vocabularies in our uh, metadata repository. And then, uh, not the least, uh, the last point is to connect data and metadata. Uh, uh, the moving from Nestar to Collectica made, uh, uh, made it like disjoint the data and metadata. And uh, we have, however, solved the solution by exploiting the physical instance ID and the version uh, metadata element to build, uh, to connect metadata to the data files. And we have built solutions that are driven by metadata and uh, the login. Thank you. Thank you, Archana. Uh, now
now I would like to introduce the next speaker, Fabio Francesi, who is a database uh, manager at SHARE. And uh, Fabio will uh, walk us through the advantages and challenges of uh, linking uh, health data to uh, social survey databases. Fabio? Hello, and welcome from my side. So as I'm talking about adding biomedical data to the share of the story, I, I will begin with um, some basic information to you to actually understand what it means. So what is share, which biomedical data, and which repository. And after that, I'll give you the, uh, an overview of the three uh, challenges and tasks that we did within Shock um, for that. So first of all, what is SHARE? That it's the uh, survey of health, aging, and retirement in Europe. That's a cross-national study. It's a survey right now conducted in 28 countries. It's a face-to-face -face interview um, that we do with our respondents. They are 50 years old and um, older. And we, we follow them over time. So the same persons are interviewed every two years. And um, it's an interdisciplinary study. We ask a lot of questions about different topics, a lot about health, um, finances, and social and family relations and stuff like that. So this is really used by different um, disciplines. But we do not only want to ask um, people about their health, we actually also want to measure a few things, and here the biomedical data um, comes in. We did two different um, projects where we actually collected more objective data compared to only asking. First one is the dry blood spots project. And here we asked people for their blood. So um, a few spots of blood from a finger prick. And this was collected on filter paper, as you can see on this picture. And these little cards with this dried blood was then sent to a biobank and was analyzed in laboratories to um, yeah, analyze for some blood markers as for example, HbA1c, which is an, an indicator for a long-term blood sugar level. Another project that we did is the accelerometry study. And here, we wanted to gather data on the activity, of, on the physical activity of respondents with actual measurements. So we used accelerometers that are sensors um, that capture the acceleration, and we asked our um, participants of the survey to wear these devices on their thigh for eight days in a row so that we can capture um, one week of movement of these people. And this data from this sensor um, is very different than the usual data that we normally have. Like it's not, as I said, not a question, not an answer to a question, but it's high frequency sensor data with a lot of measurements per second. And we have that per respondent over a whole week. So um, huge amount of data here. And a uh, last point from the basics, the repository that we have, that's the Share Research Data Center provided by Center Data, um, our partners from the Netherlands. And here we have an a dissemination platform where we release the share data and have an archive of all the old releases. And here also the users have easy and secure access to the share data. And when we thought about to add these data from these two projects, from the um, blood spots and the accelerometry, um, the first step was um, that we thought about the ethics consideration. So as this is another type of data and it's another type of data collection compared to asking questions, um, 
we reviewed and if necessary adapted our whole procedure. Um, and one very important thing um, here is the do not harm principle that we identified as very crucial and because normally for us that means um, no harm in terms of anonymity or data security and stuff like that. But here it actually includes physical harm when we take blood of people or we ask people to wear um, this accelerometer device on their thigh. So this is attached with a with a medical adhesive tape and some people have um, an allergy or get skin irritations from that. So it's actually physical harm included here. And that is our recommendation that we put in here. So to whenever you have a new type of data or a new type of data collection, um, it's good to review your existing process and adapt if necessary for all ethical issues, um, not only data security, um, but also whatever is necessary. And of course, we um, highly recommend and review by an ethics committee, although that is uh, or might be not legally required in all countries. So after the ethic consideration, the next step was to assure that our data that we provide in the repository is fair. So, and here we basically can comply with all the, the, the points here. We have findability as we have um, DOIs attached to all the data sets. The data is easy accessible. It is free of charge for scientific purpose. So users have to register. Um, there is one step to get to the data, but this is only to assure that um, the, the users have a scientific affiliation and scientific purpose, but then it's free of charge and easy accessible. Um, the data is interoperable in terms of the file formats that we provide. This can be used with all common softwares like um, Stata, SPNS, but also open source softwares such as R or Python. Our data and metadata is documented. Um, we use DDI standards here and for re reusability, uh, yeah, as I already mentioned, we have an archive of the old release versions and we have the DOIs and we, um, and users have to cite the, the data that they use. So if you, whenever you see a shared paper, you can identify which data set was used and um, by the DOI and find exactly that data set in our repository. So that um, was the second step, making data fair or assuring that the data is fair. And then the last step was the actual integration of um, this data in the repository. And we started that last year already with the accelerometry data that was published. And we had a major update beginning of this year. And here we, yeah, the, the data structure is a bit different compared to our normal survey data. As I already mentioned, the, these files are quite huge. And here we, we had another structure in, in terms of the files as normally we have the data from all of the respondents, all our participants in one data file. But here we have separate files, so each per respondent. So th that was a bit different. And we needed, of course, a lot of more storage space than usual. Um, but that was not a major issue. And yeah, so the integration started and it will continue. There will be more updates in the future for the accelerometry study and also the dried blood spots will be included in the repository. That's basically it. So th that were the three main tasks and challenges that we tackled in, in the short project. Of course, there were a lot of other different issues from beginning to end of these, um, when you from planning and collect these biomedical data. Um, there's a lot 
to consider, but here in the work package um, for the access to data, we had a look at these points and yeah, that's from my side. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Fabio. Uh, now moving on, I would like to introduce uh, Rodrigo Reyes. Uh, Rodrigo is a junior researcher at the European Value Study and uh, today he will introduce the survey codings project. Rodrigo. Uh, hi, everyone. Can you hear me through the, yeah? Okay. Um, it's a pleasure to be here to talk to you about survey codings. Um, given the short nature of this presentation, I encourage you to visit our website and also follow us on Twitter for future updates. But enough with the preamble. What exactly is survey codings? So survey codings is an online tool for the coding and measurement of crucial social science variables, such as fields of education, occupation, industry, job tasks, religious denominations, region, and cost of living. All of these are available in our platform in different languages and for multiple countries. But this is a project that was carried out by different people and um, by also different institutions. Uh, from EBS at Tilburg University, we have Claude Lags, uh, Daniela Negoita, and myself. Uh, from GASES, we have uh, Verena Ortmans and Silke Schneider. From certain Center Data, we have uh, Maurice Martens. And finally, from Wage Indicator, we have Kea Titans. And um, survey codings is intended for uh, public opinion surveys, uh, social science projects, and data archive, archives, different data archives, uh, researchers, researchers, sorry, and pretty much any other person or any other interested party. But what exactly uh, is our aim? Well, we aim to openly offer uh, classic socioeconomic uh, variable codings and measurements that, of course, are findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. Again, uh, all of these are uh, aimed to be available to interviewers and participants in real time. What exactly do we offer, though? Well, again, different social, uh, social science variables, such as fields of education in 35 languages, and we count with uh, 80 entries at the moment, levels of education for 100 um, countries with 3,500 entries, occupation for 160 countries, 54 languages, and 4,200 entries in total, a religious denomination also for 211 countries in 80 languages and with a total of 497 entries. We also have cost of living, for example, for 177 countries, 58 languages, and a total of 209 entries. Now, how exactly does survey codings um, look like? Where we here have an example of um, fields of education for someone who lives in the United Kingdom. So the user can um, enter their country or the region um, in this drop-down menu. They can see their, um, their level of education that they're looking for in the search tree, or um, they also have the option to directly look, at the, um, look up their level of education in the search box. Finally, all the information for this uh, variable or this uh, particular classification can be found in the description, sorry, in the, with more information, uh, such as a description and different classifications that we have for these different, um, different codings. Now, what's the, what does the future of survey codings hold for us? 
Well, it's, um, I think it's crucial to underline that we want to continue to uh, man maintain um, survey codings after shock is done. This involves constant maintenance to keep our variables up to date. Uh, this is because uh, standard classifications, standard international classifications change. We would also like to um, improve our non-European languages translations, so help with uh, curation of these, uh, of these translations. And we would also like to cover many more languages. But why should you be interested in survey codings? All in all, well, because um, it is a tool that lets you um, harmonize input and uh, ex ante output um, that um, reduces very much the workload of uh, surveys and also post coders. Additionally, it enables cross national uh, data collection and comparability. It enables also inter-survey cooperation, which we think is very important. And we would offer, we offer, sorry, updated standard classifications. But more importantly, and uh, yeah, more importantly, it is a field deployable tool, not only for, um, for interviewers, but also for the interviewee. And uh, it enables us to look at uh, single country codings or link other co uh, coding sets. And I think that the most crucial part of this tool is that our website's functionality can be stored as an app uh, on mobile devices in the context of face-to-face -face interviews and also web interviews. That's it. Thank you very much for your attention. Uh, thank you, Rodrigo. And now I would like to introduce our last speaker, Lidun Areide, who is a senior researcher at Morforsking. Uh, she's part of a team that developed the multilingual corpus of survey questionnaires. Um, and Areide will walk you through the process. Hello. My background is from translation studies and from corpus linguistics. And I was very happy when I was invited to join this project. In Mörforsking, we do a lot of, of surveys, like Norwegian surveys, but uh, we don't do much, of li much linguistics. So I was very happy to be included in this project. First of all, what is a corpus? Well, it's a collection of machine-readable, authentic texts that are sampled to be representative of a particular language or language variety or domain. And that could be, for instance, uh, Norwegian literary works, or it could be European medical texts, or in this case, it's European survey questionnaires. And it's important to note that a corpus gives, it tells you how a language is not how, how you traditionally thought it should be, right? So uh, the grand old man of, of uh, English grammar, Geoffrey Leach, he said that a significant advantage of the corpus linguistic method is that it allows for the analyst to approach the study of language from the context of the scientific method. So corpora were set, said to bring science back into linguistics. So what is really the MCSQ? Well, it's the first publicly available corpus of survey questionnaires. And version three has 306 distinct uh, questionnaires from the European Social Survey, from the European Value Studies, from the Survey of Health, Aging and Retirement in Europe, and from the Wage Indicator Survey. It has currently more than 4 million words and more or less 766,000 sentences. So what is important to note is that the questionnaires included comprise more than 40 years of survey research from the large-scale comparative survey projects. And these are some of the qualities of the MCSQ. It's open access, so 
anybody can use it. You can also download it if you want to. It's searchable. It's sentence aligned, which means that every sentence in the source language English is linked to all of its translation into all of the languages and language varieties. So if you search up one sentence from one survey, you get it in every language it was given in. It's annotated, which means that you can search, for instance, for word classes. It's fair. And it's a powerful instrument for the further development of best practice in design of source questionnaires and questionnaire translation methodologies. And we really hope you'll use it. These are the languages included. As I said, the source language is English, localized, localized for Great Britain. We have eight target languages and 30 language varieties. And a language variety is a use of, it's, it's the way a language is used in, in, uh, in a different country or a diff different region. Meaning that in French, for instance, we have French localized for France, for Switzerland, for Belgium, and for Luxembourg. And it's important to note also that this is a corpus of specialized language. So it's very representative of the specialized language of surveys in all of these languages and language varieties. But it's not representative of Norwegian Bokmål, for instance, because it only contains survey questions and answers. It does not contain literature and all the rest, right? So that's important to note. So why is it needed since it's so specialized? Well, the ask the same question method is at the heart of these large scale survey projects. And in the ask method, any translation is expected to produce texts that are functionally equivalent for the purpose of statistical analysis. And this means that all the concepts that are, are to be measured, they have to be, have to be kept the same across the languages and language varieties. This means they need to keep the same psychometric properties and capture the same psychological uh, variables across linguistic contexts. Also, it's important that translation teams should minimize adaptation, but still it happens. And this may lead to low quality translations and low quality translation, ha translations hamper data comparability and also they increase the errors of measurement. And therefore, it's very important to avoid these, these um, adaptations and, and changes in, in uh, or unnecessary changes. When you translate these, uh, these uh, surveys, the, normally the trapped method is used. It's co considered the gold standard in survey translation. And, but this method has a few challenges. For, uh, firstly, it's very human work intensive. And then the translations are not necessarily harmonized across, across uh, languages. I've been told that the French-Swiss team does not necessarily work with the French-French and the French-Belgian team to harmonize their, their questions and answers. And also, these variations, they may reflect uh, the team's choices and not necessarily linguistic differences. For instance, in the Swiss, uh, uh, surveys, we find a lot of, of um, uh, extremely, the use of extremely, whereas as, uh, as, as the highest most um, level, whereas uh, the other French uh, use more like uh, a lot, and there's a difference. And we'll come back to those, uh, to an example afterwards. And these variations, they may hamper uh, data comparability and also translation options can multiply and this hinders replicability. Also, the, the, there's a problem in the trap method with managing, storing, analyzing and reusing translation documentation. There's, uh, the trap method says you have to do these things, but it doesn't say anything about 
how to do it. So how can this corpus contribute to survey translation? Well, first of all, it's a searchable database. So it facilitates visualization and statistical analysis of previous transla translation decisions across languages. It's also a tool for checking the translation concepts across languages and surveys. It's also a repository for previous rounds wave, and or waves of surveys, and it allows for the retrieval uh, and present preservation of source and translated questionnaires. It provides textual data for survey translation activities and research, and it allows for the integration of translation analysis into the design of the source questionnaire, and this is important. Also, it's a valuable database for training new survey designers and also translators and for research. And a very nice thing is that it can be downloaded as a translation memory and used in a computer-assisted translation tool, a CAT tool. And here is an example of, of these inconsistencies that we found when we researched the, the MCSQ. This example is from ESS round six. Most people can be trusted. And in Belgian French, it's translated into most people are trustworthy. In Swiss French, it's transla translated into the equivalent of one can trust most people. But in French French, it's translated into the equivalence of one can trust people, full stop. This is not the same. So this is a problem. And a, w a more standardized approach to translation across countries and languages is therefore needed to enhance comparability. And this is exactly what you can use the MCSQ for. You can search how this question was posed earlier, what kind of responses it, it was given across the 30 languages. Also, as a linguist, I must say, it's also a valuable resource for regional uh, languages and, and language varieties that do not have large corpora at present. For instance, uh, Catalan, Norwegian Buchwall has large corpora, but, uh, but not from this domain, and uh, Swiss German, because you can download the entire corpus and you can enter it into your existing corpus, and then you will get a corpus that also contains survey questions. Also, it facilitates uh, the visualization. I said that. Uh, sorry, I just repeated that. Um, also, it facilitates cross-linguistic comparison, a specialized use of survey language, and the creation of translation memories and it can be uh, built and downloaded directly from, from the interface and, as I said earlier, is compatible with especially the MateCat translation tool. We've had a really successful dissemination program this year. We've attended, we've had nine presentations in international conferences, really big international conferences. We wrote two academic papers and one science communication blog. And uh, the corpus has been live for over a year now, and we're really, really happy with it. It's really working well, and we're just hoping that more and more people will use it. But where do we go from here? Because a corpus can be two things, or it can be many things, but it can be a snapshot of a linguistic reality, or it can be a resource that grows over time and becomes larger and larger and more and more useful. And today, the MCSQ is a really well-made snapshot of 306 distinct questionnaires. But it has the potential to become a an immensely useful resource also in the future. It's really all about sustainability and exploitation because new data become available all the time. And for corpus being you know, highly statistical, bigger is always better. New functions will be needed, 
the technology will develop and things need to be reorganized and updated and maintained. And also, um, the project is finished and how do we teach, how do we get the funding to teach students, linguists, researchers, translators to use this tool. So basically, how do we keep it up to date and alive? Now the UPF, Universitat Pompeu Fabra, will sustain it for two years, but further investments are needed for a long-term vision of this project or this resource. It's got a new home now in Bergen, University of Bergen, the Clarino project, where also my, my other pro, uh, corpus baby is hosted. I am also the author of the Norwegian Spanish parallel corpus. And uh, the Clarino has the, the resources to maintain it as is, but not to expand it. So the important thing now is to find the resources for expansion into more studies in time, adding future start studies, and also for developing strategies for more automatic uploads and treatments of new surveys. For instance, we're hoping that in the future, uh, when a team has constructed a survey, they themselves can upload it into the corpus. So these are the things we are working on now and, and hoping that will materialize. This is how you cite the corpus. And these are the works cited. Oh, the thank you, sorry, the thank you slide has disappeared. Well, <laughs> sorry, thank you for your attention. <laughs> Thank you, Lidun. That was an interesting presentation. Um, now let's open the floor for uh, the panel discussion. And I invite the speakers uh, on the stage. <laughs> and are there any questions from the online audience? Okay, are there any questions in this audience? Okay. Sorry, uh, Kea Tate, this is Wait Indicator Survey. And I was uh, asked, wondering about your uh, database. Uh, do you also maintain the years? So I can imagine very well a survey question asked in 1950 is different from those in 2022. So that's Thank you. Can you hear me? Well, um, every single question. Every single question in every single survey is has a unique uh, tag that shows which survey is uh, it's uh, collected from the round and and the number. So you can always trace when the survey uh, was given and, and which survey it's from. So you can trace, you know, how, it would be a great research pro project to see how questions have, have, have changed over time. Thank you. Actually, my question is also related to this one and I was just curious about the, the amount of metadata um, that you're storing uh, uh, in the corpus in relation to uh, both the question items plus all of the uh, um, sort of additional bits of information that sometimes come with a question item, uh, sort of instructions to interviewers or to the respondent, uh, prompts, show cards, uh, uh, response categories, and very importantly, and, and, and this is a very strategic and kind of uh, uh, pragmatic question because we're, we're setting up a, a question data bank uh, uh, linked also um, uh, to shock. I, we wanted to know whether we could just download <laughs> somehow from your 
uh, uh, service, uh, at least for the, 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 uh, the surveys that you've already indicated that are included, the European Social Survey, the European Value Studies, uh, without having to redo manually all of this in Collectica questionnaire. So I was just curious if you could give us a little bit of information of what can be reused for other tools that are being developed in, in shock or whether that might just not work from an interoperability point of view. Thank you. Uh, I'm, not, uh, I'm not in charge of this project and I'm not the, the technical uh, uh, person here, but as far as I understand it, you can download uh, what you need and you can reuse it. But check it out with Diana Savala Rojas, who is the leader of, of this project. But which, which survey, where are you from again? Paris, and uh, we're uh, in Work Package 9, the data communities, mm -hmm. and we're, we've produced uh, the Ethnic and Migrant Minority Survey Registry, but mm -hmm. also we're now in the process of uh, uh, launching a sort of alpha or better, we will see, yeah. version of the Ethnic and Migrant Minority Question Data right. Bank. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, we want that, uh, it's not our priority to actually do uh, some of uh, the, the general population um, surveys, but it would be nice to at least connect to them in some mm. way. Mm. Thanks. Thank you. Are there any questions for our online presenter? Okay, there are two people. Go on. Hi. Uh, it's for the corpus too. Uh, I would like to know if uh, it's performing how you expect it, like are people using it, downloading it, and uh, doing research with the data that you have there. Uh, this is question one. And the two is about like the same language, different questions. Uh, does that represent like a cultural element or are you treating it as a, just a, a failure in translation or is there, did you study that? Did you research that? Or it's just a concern that you have by the moment? Thanks. Well, um, let's, uh, uh, for the last question uh, first, we, we don't treat it at all. We just, uh, we just assemble it, put it together. And in the paper that we wrote, that's uh, bound to be, to be published in META, uh, which is a, a, a high-level journal of translation. We, we, are, we are doing a little, uh, a little bit, or a small study on, on how, on these differences, showing that they are semantically that the translations in some cases are semantically different and, and, and they measure different um, things, basically. And, um, but but we're, not, we're not saying, we're not marking it in yellow, saying error, or all we are doing is, is assembling this and, and putting it together so, so people can use it for research and, and for, for creating better, uh, even better uh, surveys later on. Sorry, I can't remember your first question. Yes, yes. Um, I've done a little bit of research on it myself. It's uh, working beautifully, of course. And, uh, and <laughs> no, but we're, we're, it's an extremely dedicated team, ranging from Knut Hoffland, the grand old man of corpus linguistics that kind of invented the field uh, 50 years ago, uh, to Daniele, who's uh, a super smart uh, uh, programmer. And uh, so, so it's, it's really, really, uh, it's a really great team working on it. And I'm honored to be part of it. Thank you, uh, Ron Becker, EOS Future. I, uh, I have a question on sustainability. Um, are you considering licensing for, for commercial use, uh, any of the tools? Uh, as far as I know, we're not. As far as I know, it's created to be open access and to be uh, usable, free for all. But. Um, I, uh, since I'm not working on this project uh, regularly, my, my job was finished almost a year ago in this project, and since I stepped in on seven days' notice uh, to give this speech, I must admit I really don't know. So Diana would be the person to, to direct this question to. Yes. 
Kea? Okay, yes. Um, I think that survey codings and your tool are very adjacent to each other. So your, your database will have questions like, what is your occupation? What is your education? What is your religion? That's standard questions that are asked in, in social science surveys. And most of the times it will be an open field, text field for the answer. And you will hardly register all the different, if it was a closed question, then you will hardly register all the uh, response items. But that is what survey codings could deliver. Survey codings could deliver, uh, the, if, if used in the surveys, all the response items for those long list questions, what we call long list questions. So you can have 5,000 occupational titles, uh, whatever, but they are not in your database. No. Or you can have, I don't know, 2,000 educational categories and they are not in your database but they are in survey coding. So somehow it would be good at least to quote each other. I don't know, just a thought. I'm thinking that um, for, 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 uh, for corpora, um, it's always good to, to grow. It's always good to be, be since, since they are statistical in nature, you know, the more data, the, the, the better always. Uh, what is important is to, for, for a corpus is that it shows the language as it is. So, so we are only including what, what has been given, not what could be given or should be given, only as it is. So that's maybe the distinction between a corpus and, and, and a database, but I'm thinking that uh, the information is reusable. I, I do have a question. I, I'm having a hard time to grasp what exactly a corpus is. Yeah. So, does it work with connection between uh, between words, or because you say it's a, it's statistical in nature? Mm -hmm. So, could you explain it a bit? Uh, well, a corpus, uh, as I said, is a collection of text. Corpus just means body, body of text, and and uh, the text is structured, so it's searchable, and it's always aligned. Uh, and this corpus is aligned on sentence level. So if I search for um, European, I will get every single sentence in the corpus that has the word European included, and I would get every single translation of every single of those sentences. And then I can see how the word European has been translated in 1950s or today. Hopefully it hasn't changed much. <laughs> uh, does that answer your question? It, 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 corpus is like a linguistic tool. So it is a database. Um, and uh, uh, what more do you need to know? <laughs> So it is a database, but it, it's a database uh, that has, that's normally used for, for linguistic research. And um, there are big national corpora. And uh, if a corpus is representative of something, which they should be, it can always be compared to a national corpora. For instance, uh, there are large British and American uh, also Norwegian national and Spanish national corpora. And then you can see if the frequency of a word, for instance, the word European is, is the same in, in uh, this survey as it is in the general language. And you compare, can compare different corpora of different sizes to each other, but uh, to test the uh, frequencies is normally what we test in, in, in linguistics. Uh, but again, it's important to, to note that a corpus can only represent what it is representative of. So it, you can never generalize uh, the findings from a, a specific or a specified corpus back to the general population, right? This is classical statistics, right? 
Are there any other questions, maybe for our online speakers? Yes, I was actually just wondering, uh, because you've now explained both the survey codings tool um, and the MCSQ tool, and I'm just wondering, especially if Arshana and Fabio, who are actually running multilingual surveys, right? So is any of this to, of any practical use to you? So is this something that you can use to improve the surveys, and is it something that you're planning to use to improve the surveys? Yes, it is definitely. Um, so as share is included in the corpus and also, yeah, um, we, we deliver input for that. So we have a lot of languages. We have, as I said, 28 countries, but a lot of more languages um, that is included in there. And for the survey codings, we do we use also this, um, especially the chop coder, the, the chop description, so the um, yeah, occupational descriptions um, is what we use in our survey? Uh, in our tool, we currently do not use or connect to corpus, but I see a possibility in future. And also, as uh, they mentioned, if corpus becomes a living database and not just a snapshot, then the value will definitely increase. And the other part, we use a lot of external, like, as I mentioned, SESTA control vocabularies, because we don't want to do an internal work. We want to use a sector standard solutions and databases which exist. So if corpus becomes a sector-wide used international database of questions, then this would be something we could reuse in a solution. And that would increase interoperability of our service and our metadata, definitely. But currently, we do not use it. I see a lot of possibilities in future. Thank you. Uh, Lidun wanted to add something. Yeah, just one thing I forgot to say when you asked me what a corpus does. Uh, these days, the main function of a corpora is to train uh, translators, automatic translators, like Google, uh, Google and uh, Translate and all of the other translators. The gold standard for for training these are are well-made corpora. So so there's. There is a possibility, of, of course, of selling this data, but uh, I'm, not the, I'm not the person in charge, so I don't know. Just, just to add, uh, we plan to use ELST thesaurus uh, in our solution, and I see Corpus as kind of thesaurus for questions. Uh, so it has potential, but thesaurus is already a mature uh, database and it's used by multiple archives and work and the translation is kind of owned by archives who are contributing to ELST so then it is also growing it's not just single snapshot but it's growing and versioned so we are planning to use ELST thesaurus and uh, corpus would be kind of similar to that just for questions yeah, so uh, I'm Yuri. I would like to also add uh, uh, some input to your question before uh, about uh, using the the, 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 the the corpus, but also the survey codings in uh, in the share uh, enterprise. Because I, I think especially the, the, the corpus is, a, is, a, is an example how shock or package four in this case work together. And so the first uh, brick, the first uh, stone was uh, setting up the corpus. Then we have other two tasks within the same work package. They were using the same corpus for their own, uh, their, their own task. So there was really a successful co uh, collaboration. So one was uh, using the corpus to create uh, translation memories to feed uh, in a cut tool, uh, we've mentioned before, uh, the, the, the environment of the translators when they were translating ESS and also uh, other, uh, other service. And the second one, uh, when, uh, you were, uh, when we were using uh, the, the corpus to train a domain-specific uh, machine uh, uh, translation uh, to provide a translation back to the, to, the, to the translator from the machine, 
we were using a domain specific corpus uh, adding on top of the general one so that was a really you know successful story for shock and uh, and, uh, and for us you know it's just another step towards a common goal yes and and uh, i wish my sincere hope is that we get to expand it in in the number of languages also we chose these eight because they had lots of uh, lots of uh, varieties. I think Norwegian was chosen just because of Knut and me, because we <laughs> to contribute a little bit back to to, to Norway. But uh, but the other languages have lots and lots of and Catalan because of UPF. But but there are lots of languages that are not uh, it has not expanded into, and uh, and it would be lovely. To, to make it more comprehensive, to make it to expand it into all, all the, all the languages of the share, for instance. Okay. Yeah. Um, one possibility of your database is that all the sentences can be compared to the general body of knowledge of that language in the country. So you can identify, you can classify or index each survey question regarding its understandability. So, okay, and that is urgently needed for surveys. I, s I see quite a lot of surveys, and sometimes there are survey questions that you really think, hey, you need a university degree to understand this question. Well, that means that all the lower skills drop out or do not reply. So I think that your database could be easily used to do this kind of test and to improve survey questions so that they become understandable for throughout the whole educational degrees. I agree. I, I just read the, I'm making a survey now for, uh, for a study that I'm doing and I'm basing it on, on the on a really large Norwegian uh, survey that's given to, to children uh, in the 10th grade. And I'm a linguist and I have very many years of linguistic practice and I'm thinking, what is it they mean here? I, I, I couldn't answer this. And I'm thinking, uh, then we have a problem. Sorry, Archana, I didn't see you, please. Uh, I just had a comment. We talk about reusability and uh, about being able to use uh, specific databases or repositories or standards outside systems. And one of the uh, part of the recommendation we mentioned also is, and I, this is more like a request to everybody out there and not a comment, is uh, as long as versions and unique identifiers are not supported, then reusing this content and making them kind of uh, used in different uh, technical solutions becomes difficult because then identifying what exactly they mean and referring back the versions, actual versions over evolution of a particular uh, information becomes difficult. So it's more of a comment and request that if you're planning to do any kind of repositories, any kind of uh, reusable uh, data collection, then please take into consideration versioning, a good versioning system and unique identifier. They are basic to make systems fair and to make systems understand information and actual implementation like of interprobability in praxis. So that's more of a comment. Thank you. Thank you, Archana. Are there any other questions? Yes, please. Jill. Thanks. A question to you, Fabio. Um, well, I have heard a bit about um, how tough it was to uh, um, to um, go in the field with the share uh, interviews in the time of Corona. I wonder if you could share a little bit of experience about that. It's well done that you managed to gather the data for this sensitive, uh, of this sensitive character in the period uh, which is behind us. Yeah, sure. So I'm not an expert on this, but I can uh, tell you what I know. So um, actually the, the um, fieldwork two years ago had, uh, was stopped 
due to COVID and in March 2020. So we actually had to stop the whole field work um, and couldn't go on with that. But then we set up a telephone survey to ask some pandemic related questions um, in summer 2020. But now again, we are in the field since November, as far as I know, and we were still in the field with all these hard conditions. And it, the, the progress is not that fast as in, under normal conditions, um, but I think we, we do quite good. And yeah, but, but this really depends on the country and, and on the situation there. So there are big country differences. Uh, as I um, do not monitor the field work, uh, I cannot tell you more than that, sorry. How long is your sample? How did you manage to get these blood samples? Ah, okay. So the the uh, blood sample was done in a, a previous way, so it was not affected um, by COVID or these um, the, the, these, this whole uh, pandemic. So there we had, yeah, it, it was quite of an effort to train the interviewers. So that was the, the blood sample were taken by the interviewers themselves and, and no nurses or something like that. So um, that, that I think that the most part was training uh, and a good training and explain everything carefully to the interviewers and let them practice to take the blood. So it's, it's yes, yeah, just a finger prick, but still interviewers had to practice this. And um, in, if possible in share, we use the same interviewers for the same respondents. So, um, it, it's quite, um, yeah, in, in best case, the respondents know the interviewer for some years and that gives some, um, some trust to the, this person and, um, but still, of course, not everybody um, participated in that study, but I, I think we were doing quite good with, as I said, um, with a lot of training. We have three more minutes for one last question. Okay, I, I have a question and I would like to address it to Rodrigo. Um, so Rodrigo, one of our predefined questions was uh, about the translations of the occupational database. We know that it's a huge occupational database. So how, how did you translate it? Uh, well, it was a word for, for a period of 20 years if I'm not mistaken, and it was done by uh, national labor experts and also professional translators. And uh, it was also validated by, um, by, if I'm not mistaken, um, people who spoke the language. Am I right, Native yeah? speakers. <laughs> okay. Thank you, Rodrigo. So any other remarks before we wrap up this session? Thank you maybe for the engagement. Maybe I'll just say one more thing that yes. Diana told me to say, um, but I forgot. Uh, well, uh, you may wonder why a corpus is needed because all of these, the share, all of these uh, surveys have their own websites where you can access the surveys, but there the material is in, in PDFs. So it's not downloadable, it's not searchable. And, and so basically what we're doing is, is making everything available and usable. So. In line of the fair principles. Yes. Okay. Thank you for uh, the engaging discussion. Have a nice afternoon and see you tomorrow. <laughs>